Okay, thank you, David. Uh, yes, so I'm kind of in this uh, little transition area where uh, I was with Tree of Life Nursery. Um, I don't feel I was always be with Tree of Life Nursery, but for the most part, yeah, I was there for the last seven years uh, until recently I've uh, joined with the Catalina Island Conservancy. So I actually haven't started yet. Uh, I, I start on Thursday. Uh, I just moved to the island this weekend. I just set up my internet, so I'm glad to see that that's working. Um, but yeah, so I'm here in Avalon right now on Catalina, and I'm going to talk about today uh, something really near and dear to my heart, which is the plants of Catalina Island. And uh, um, yeah, so uh, if anybody knows me previously, uh, my background was in plant propagation. I went to uh, get my master's. I think a lot of people in the native plant society world uh, kind of know me from Dudley Award work at Tree of Life. Uh, and so there are Dudleys here on the islands, which I'll talk about. Um, but I was really focused on propagation towards saving a lot of those species from the poaching. Um, but uh, my real focus was on how to grow rare plants. And so using horticulture and using propagation and uh, some, some traditional, but also advanced methods uh, to do so. So uh, that's really what my job will be now. Uh, at the Catalina Island Conservancy, where I am now the rare plant ecologist. And so, um, yeah, I start on Thursday, <laughs> but that's Thursday. Today, I'm gonna talk to you all about the plants of Catalina Island. And so this is a real fun presentation. Um, so I'm really excited uh, to present it to you all today. Let me share my screen here. Oh, since I go. Okay, can everybody see that in my screen right now? One person. You're good. Just, good? Yeah. Oh, good. I was like to check. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna hide this. There we go. There, that's better. Okay, so we are gonna talk about the plants of Catalina Island. Uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people probably coming to this talk today uh, have been to Catalina and a lot of you have fallen in love with it, know that it's a beautiful place, uh, somewhere that you can really go on an awesome vacation, just right there off our coast uh, on the mainland of California. So we're very lucky to have it. And we have some really, really cool, unique plants here on Catalina Island, some really rare, in fact, some of the rarest in North America here on uh, this island and a few of the others in the Channel Islands, but Catalina is a very special place. You know, it's known as the island of romance. Um, and I think it's really romantic for many people to come and visit um, or like me now move and work here. <laughs> so with this presentation, I'm gonna go over uh, a lot of the natural history. So showing you kind of what happens when plants actually get to uh, the island and, and how they evolved to be here and, and some really unique phenomenon uh, being in this isolated landmass. And uh, I'll also go into some of the horticulture as well. So like I said, uh, I was the uh, former production manager at Tree of Life Nursery. So uh, this is a large scale native plant nursery um, focused on growing plants. Uh, they're celebrating 40, now we're into 41 years. Uh, in that. So um, it was a really unique position and, and uh, learned a lot. And so here uh, I will start to bring some of those skills to my new job as the rare plant ecologist for the Catalina Island Conservancy. So I've now joined this team. There's a few, few of the conservancy members here where we went to try to really survey one of the rarest plants in North America, which I'll get into in a moment. So this is actually my second time moving to an island. Uh, I studied in my undergrad uh, on an island, uh, the big island of Hawaii. And so uh, I studied island biogeography, uh, but really my degree was in coastal resource and watershed management. So basically land management of the natural resources in and around um, and, uh, on islands and, and coastal regions in general. So, uh, but what I was really focused on too is picking up a skill set in plant tissue culture, which is a kind of advanced method of growing plants in test tubes. And um, in Hawaii, they were using it for a lot of really rare species, species that had their pollinators extinct. There was less than 10 
less than 20 or so individuals in, in existence. And so that's a skill I really wanted to learn that eventually we're gonna use here on the island, which I'll talk about in a moment. So uh, I was just talking previously that was asked uh, before this presentation started, but uh, how did I get into native plants? And, and really it started with this woman. This is my, my grandmother, uh, Donna Allison, uh, Donna Bullard, and she and her family and our family uh, have been coming here for generations. So um, this, was, this is my great grandparents and my grandmother there. Uh, here on Catalina with her boat, the Doja. Um, I think my aunt is in there. In Catalina. In here. Hey. Oh. I think if we can mute, there we go. Uh, yeah, I think my aunt's in this in this feed too. She, yeah, so thank you for sharing these photos with me. Uh, but yeah, so we've been, my family's been coming to Catalina for quite some time uh, as boaters and um, as nature lovers as well. Um, and so as my grandparents then that, that, that more recent generation uh, also came to the island with their boat. This is Sonrisa. I think this is near um, uh, uh, Moonstone Cove. And then uh, now with my boat, uh, the SV Californica. So I like talking to plant groups like this that appreciate that weird name on the back of my boat. But um, yeah, celebrating the plants of California. And so we've been conservancy members for many generations. So I, I actually have some of their old uh, conservancy burgies and I've uh, been lucky then to add my own here on the, on the right. Okay, so what are the Channel Islands? So we know that Catalina is just one of those uh, uh, islands within the, the Channel Island chain. So we have uh, about eight islands here on uh, just off the coast that we consider the Channel Islands. We know the Channel Islands, um, well, all of you uh, at, in this group at, at the uh, South Coast chapter, you know, have those cha Northern Channel Islands just not that far off of off your coast and you can see Catalina as well. Uh, but these are islands that have formed off California and it's part of a chain with the islands of California, which I, also, well, a lot of us include up in San Francisco, all the way down, in, and even in the Baja as well. There's some really rare, unique islands uh, uh, down there, and, and they have a lot of these rare species. And some of them that also occur on the Channel Islands that we have here, just off the coast of the U.S. Um, Channel Island, California. And so I'll also go into the island biogeography. Like I said, how do plants get to the island? And then what happens once they've actually made it here and how they have evolved and some of these really interesting uh, uh, phenomenon that occur in their evolution and, and, and their adaptations uh, in this isolation. So after I go through that, I'll also go over different habitat types you'll see on the, uh, on the island here. And then, uh, then we'll do something real fun. We're gonna go on a virtual sailing. I'll take you all uh, on my sailboat uh, the SV Californica, and we'll go explore Catalina together. So uh, we'll go ashore. I'm we'll hit... class right now, live. <laughs> oh, ask it. There, oh, there we go. Anyways, uh, yeah, so um, yeah, we'll go ashore. We'll go ex see these habitats and go see some of these plants out in the wild um, here in this in this presentation. And I'll also go some of the ecology, how they evolve in their in their or relate to the, their environment and also some really cool horticultural aspects that you can then use them in your garden as well. They're great in a garden setting, especially along the coast um, and elsewhere. Uh, they do really, really well. Okay, so like I said, what are the Channel Islands? There are eight islands. Uh, we typically like to talk about them into the northern and southern Channel Islands. And there is some differences in geography and geology in that as well, but uh, for the most part, the Northern Channel Islands up here is uh, the, starting from uh, the closest. You have Anacapa, you have Santa Cruz, Santa Rosa, and then way out here is San Miguel Island. Uh, these uh, islands all used to actually be one island called Santa Rosa Island. And so um, a lot of the species can, have, uh, can, can, uh, can be very similar on some of these islands, but the size and different things of the island and those isolation now, um, they have different species that might be 
just on one herb versus the other, which I'll go into later when we talk about endemism and um, also that theory of island biogeography. Uh, and then we have the Southern Islands. So most of these are owned, uh, these two uh, here, uh, uh, San Nicolas and San Clemente Island are kind of off limits, uh, they're, they're military. Uh, then we have this little one up here, Santa Barbara Island. Uh, and then what we're gonna talk about today, which is Catalina Island. So Catal Santa Catalina Island, so all the, the, the Channel Island names have Santa basically in front of it. So San, well, besides San Clemente, San Miguel, um, Santa Rosa, uh, Anna Kappa doesn't have that, but Santa Catalina, San Nicolas, and um, Santa Barbara, but uh, in San Clemente. But uh, for indigenous peoples, the, the islands was uh, previously called Pimu uh, or Pimuna. Uh, and um, yeah, so they have been coming to the island for quite some time and have some really significant history here on, on, on Catalina. Um, but um, I would really love if we could get more people to tell that story. Um, so yeah, the, the Channel Island or Catalina, uh, it's about 76 square miles. So a pretty big island uh, in, the, in the Channel Island chain. Uh, and it's just pretty close here off the, off the coast. So for many of you that would like to visit, it's about an hour boat ride for most people, an hour, hour and 15. Um, and about 22 miles, I think is the closest to some, um, to Catalina. Uh, and many people may know the four prep song, uh, 26 miles, uh, which is a catchy song all about coming to Catalina. Uh, but yeah, about that is how, how, um, how far away it is from the mainland. And uh, we have a lot of plants here. We have 421 plants uh, around that. I think it's growing every day. We find some new ones. Hopefully we find some more and uh, hopefully we don't lose any. So uh, here on Catalina. And, and we have nine endemic plants, which is really cool. And um, we should really clear up those terms. So uh, a lot of people might use these interchangeably, but we'll really, the words matter. So we're gonna, we're gonna define these. So indigenous or native, uh, these are plants that naturally occur within a particular area or region. So you can say that these are plants are native to California or native to the Channel Islands. Um, but endemic is kind of, it really focusing in to a specific area. So a species native to one location and nowhere else. So for example, some people might know the island bush poppy or Dendromecon harfortii, which does occur on a few other islands. Uh, so we can say that it's native or indigenous to the Channel Islands, but you wouldn't, it, but you wouldn't say that it's, um, oh, well, actually, let me, let me clarify that, that a species like the Dudley uh, virus, some species Passei down here, or a Catalina Island Dudley only occurs on Catalina Island. So it's therefore endemic to Catalina Island. You, you wouldn't say it's indigenous to a lot of these other islands because it only occurs in one specific area, so it's endemic. So that's what I mean by Catalina having nine endemic species. Uh, those species um, do not occur anywhere else. So you wouldn't say they're really technically indigenous, but um, but there's another subspecies of this Dudleya here called Dudleya virens subspecies insularis, which does occur on Catalina but it's not endemic to Catalina because it also occurs within the region of, of, this, uh, of this chapter here uh, on Palos Verdes, which itself used to be a Channel Island. So historically, this was part of the, the Catalina or the Channel Island chain and uh, through um, history has filled in and to become basically part of the mainland. So the other species of Dudley of Irons that occurs on this island on Catalina is indigenous to Catalina, but it's not endemic because it does also occur on the mainland right by you guys. I think it's your chapter logo. I could be wrong. Okay. So this is kind of part of that island biogeography. So how do plants get to the island? And so this is part of that natural history. So uh, we usually say um, some of the three W's, although there is an extra one. So there's wind, wings, waves, 
and then one of my favorite, which is vicariant transport through ritual endemism, resulting in in, in, <laughs> in uh, unique species. So, or ritual endemism. So, what does that mean? We learned endemic as a plant that occurs in one spot, uh, but a relic or ritual. So, it's a kind of a story of the past. And so, we'll get into what that means. So, wind um, is is a big factor in how it transports propagules, how it transports seeds. And so this is uh, Seth Kalpanen, who, who uh, previously was the botanist here on Catalina, and he was showing me some of the uh, native milkweed. So people may know this plant, um, Asclepius fascicularis, an important plant for the monarch butterflies. Uh, but it does occur here on Catalina. So again, it's not endemic to Catalina, it's indigenous, where it also occurs here. Um, and uh, this plant, if anybody's grown it, which I hope you are, uh, has these these specialized structures on the seeds to help it be transported by wind. And so that the way that plants can get to other places and so, and especially to islands. So big current winds coming up and, and can blow seeds all around. In fact, all the way to about Hawaii, uh, there was a native plant to California, an aster that made it to the big island in Maui uh, in Hawaii and resulted in these silver swords. And so they just traced the whole lineage back and it ended up being a California native eventually, or at one point, uh, and then evolved to this really unique plant on, on Hawaii. But it got there through these upper cor currents by wind. So that's one way that plants get to uh, an island and repopulate onto new areas. Another version is wings. So um, we kind of really think about that as birds. So birds do eat seeds but they also can have seeds stuck to the wings or body parts of, of them themselves. So it's not just birds, but it's a good way, catchy way to remember that animals can also transport, including us. Uh, if you come to Catalina and you're be, be mindful of the seeds and things that get on your boots coming here to um, not bring invasive species, but that's really how seeds like to uh, transport. So they are stuck in the ground, they're rooted, and they will use the energy of other mechanisms to transport seed and basically transport propagules to the next generation to then survive. So uh, they use animals to actually do that, whether through the gut uh, of the plant or of the animal and then transport it as it flies or, or moves and walks to different areas or just stuck on their body just like Dakota the nursery dog here. So this is Dakota at Tree of Life Nursery, a very famous dog, smartest dog in the world uh, that I've ever met. Speaks three languages, speaks Spanish, English, and dog. Uh, but this Dakota would, has this beautiful hair uh, and all the time he comes into the, would come into the nursery with seeds stuck to him. And it's just, there's a perfect example of how these plants have, have adapted and evolved to use the energy and trick basically Dakota to spread uh, future generations of that plant elsewhere and expand that population. Another example is waves. So we just had a big storm here and, and uh, a lot of seeds in the watersheds and, and anywhere around from the mainland can then get washed out and make its way out to through these currents in the ocean um, to to then land on uh, on the islands or new areas. And uh, it could go from inner island or any other areas. And so a lot of plants will evolve uh, to float the, the seed and, and the sperm and, and, and um, all the, all the uh, parts of a seed with a, a little baby plant in there that can then make it and, and live in a new area. So a perfect example that a lot of people may know are coconuts and how coconuts float, but every coconut is a seed. And as you can see over here, just a, uh, it's a very big seed. And uh, we use a lot of that energizing um, uh, milk and, and meat of that seed, but so does the plant. The plant uses that all and once it lands, it then will then grow and, and help that plant then set its own roots and sort of uh, establish as it, as it moves into the future. And so um, that's just for seeds, but also cuttings as well, or plant parts. And I think um, I was uh, anchored, I think this was around um, White's Landing, 
and noticed something floating in there that looked like plants. I thought it was a weird looking seaweed. And when I got a little closer, uh, I started to realize that it was Dudleya. And uh, uh, so it had fallen maybe off a cliff through erosion uh, in a storm, but there it is and it's floating and those, the succulent. So, uh, and, and easily kind of root from cuttings. And so this could then float around and land ashore and theoretically, and then become a new plant established and then put out seeds once it has, and then a new population of that plant can then, uh, can then start to thrive. And so I was then later, I was um, at Cat Harbor on the back side of the island and uh, saw this big kind of log looking thing that had washed ashore uh, at, at, at the little calm anchorage in there in that kind of estuary area or the salt marsh. And went ashore and saw this and picked it up. And sure enough, it was the codex of a uh, Dudleya, a pretty sizable one. Um, but you can see the living part still, the meristem here, still able to, um, still alive with a lot of stored energy uh, here in the body of this of the plant. And from that, it's been able to use that energy and then actually started to push out brand new roots as it was ashore. And so this was likely the, the uh, virus subspecies insularis, which you have on the mainland, whether it came from the mainland, I don't know, uh, but likely came from areas around uh, on the backside of the island here. But really gorgeous plant, but here's the perfect example and proof that this is what plants can do. Um, they can get to different places by uh, waves. And then a real fascinating one, which is relictual endemism, so a relic. It's endemic here, so this plant uh, on the on the right here, this is uh, a Santa Cruz island or a, a northern island or fern leaf ironwood. Uh, we have our own uh, species subspecies here in, in Catalina that's very similar, um, very closely related. Um, but these plants are relics of the past. So uh, the, it's endemic, meaning again that it they occur in one place and nowhere else. But so when I say a relic is that this plant was actually formerly widespread throughout the, the Southwest uh, and through the, um, the Western areas of the US. And through different climate changes and, and, and different um, evolution, it actually found refuge here and has a nice climate here to then uh, keep these plants where they now survive only here on the Channel Islands. And so um, that's what I mean, it's a relic it's endemic here where it used to be indigenous to a wider spreaded area, but now it only occurs here in the Channel Islands. And we have a subspecies here only on Catalina Island. So it's a relic or relictual endemism. That's fascinating. And yeah, so this is the ironwood, or I said the lionothamnus. And it used to be just widespread. I think, I think Utah is the furthest way that it's in the fossil records all around and it used to be way more uh, widespread uh, but today only occurs here in the Channel Islands um, the fern leaf up in the Northern Islands uh, and uh, Catalina has its own subspecies that only occurs here and so these are the differences you'll probably see you definitely would see more if you see this plant uh, lanothamnus or ironwoods like this uh, Channel Island ironwoods in the horticultural trade you're likely going to see the fern leaf which is here on the left and you can see it has this serrated type leaf. Um, and this is subspecies Asplenifolius. This is the, it tricked me for a while. Um, there's two eyes right here in Asplenifolius. <laughs> so um, be mindful of that. Uh, and then our rare um, and uh, species of big concern for us here on Catalina that to, to conserve is this subspecies Floribund. Uh, yeah, so it's both of these are Linothamnus floribundus, but they're two different subspecies. So you have Linothamnus floribundus, subspecies Asplenifolius, which is the fern leaf ironwood, and then subspecies floribundus. So floribundus floribundus, which is the Catalina ironwood. Um, so those are the two different. You see it has a real straight leaf. I do notice a fragrance difference. It's um, the the leaf of the they're they're both fragrant leaves but the the one here on Catalina Island Floribundus Floribundus 
is much more um, uh, uh, fragrant and has almost like this coconut sunscreen kind of buttery smell to it. It's really, really attractive. So um, yeah, hopefully we can get these into more conservation groves and out to where um, people can appreciate them more. Okay, so this is the, the nerdy science stuff, but the, the theory of island biogeography. And um, so plants, once they get to an island, that's just one of the challenges. And so how far away a plant or a, uh, an island or, or a landmass is from another area, uh, say the mainland, uh, the, the closer they are, the more likely propagules are gonna get to it. The further away they are, there's less chance that the, that the seeds and propagules will make it to that island. And so that affects what actually will get there. And so you, on this graph, you see uh, how the distance of the plants will actually interact with how many species will then get there and also how many of them will succeed. And so that rate of extension, uh, immigration, and then actually how many of them, so how many get there and then how many actually survive. So that rate of extinction. And so, as well as the size of an island, so the target size. So if it's a smaller island, uh, then it's going to uh, be harder for the propagules and the chances of them actually landing on that island uh, are smaller. And if the, uh, in comparison to if the plant or the island was much larger. And so the larger the island, the larger area it is for the, the propagules to get there and then also establish, there's more area there for them to also establish and find their niches and be able to uh, survive. So from that, it's actually, you can have a predictable model. And we see this on the different channel islands where you can then say and see about how, put it plotted on a graph and say and predict and, and, and understand uh, how many species actually make it to those islands and survive. So like I said, we have about 421 here on Catalina. And so that fits pretty well within this model. And third, after a long status quo. And so that it's, and I say that as a model, and we think of islands uh, in ecology and plants, uh, but it's really just a concept that this uh, study uh, and published really uh, by uh, MacArthur and Wilson uh, really made sense to why uh, not just islands, although the islands is a model that can then be applied to uh, a valley or anywhere else within the, the ecosystem or, or, or landscapes out in the world, that um, this, the, this principle still works on, on how plants and how they get to different areas. It doesn't have to just be an island. It could just be um, how they populate and find different areas of suitable habit. Okay, so some of the really cool phenomenons of ecology or, and evolution of, of, of not just plants, but animals when they get to the island. So you, you're isolated on this landmass, right? Um, and so interesting things happen. So for animals, they actually get smaller and they have dwarfism. And so we see that with our island fox that actually is about, I think, uh, about the third the size of some of our mainland uh, foxes. Um, and so there's less resources, there's less uh, um, spaces and things for them to, to then survive. So they've actually evolved to be smaller animals um, to scale to, to um, survive in those habitats. Um, actually, humans are another example of that. Uh, they're, you know, we are Homo sapien, uh, but there were uh, Homo floriensis, which occurred on islands, and they were much, much smaller humans that, that they found within the fossil records. So even that example, uh, occurs as well um, uh, to humans. But animals typically and generally speaking become smaller on islands where plants actually get bigger. So this is a uh, experience, an island phenomenon of gigantism. So they've been released from a lot of pressures. So uh, that, for example, the uh, uh, herbivores. So it's really hard for deer to swim across a channel or, or make it in some way. But uh, so these plants have evolved without the pressure of being eaten. And so they lose thorns, they'll lose, um, they'll lose uh, really complex chemicals that make them bitter or uh, less appetizing or even, or even poisonous. And so 
these plants have, have allocated their resources more effectively to not need such defense mechanisms can actually focus on seed production really um, is, is the name of the game. Uh, but you'll see this on, so they'll, they'll need to, they're able to then get much larger leaves. Uh, they have to um, kind of compete as well. So they're able to, with other plants, so they'll actually put the resources into that. And so we actually see much larger plants, uh, larger size, bigger leaves. Uh, we live in a nice area here on the, on the island with um, fog and everything too, where it allows for bigger leaves and, and everything like that. So um, as you can see here, so on the coast, we know coast live oaks and other plants that um, you know, have really attractive oak leaves. But this on the island, this island oak or Quercus tomentella, uh, can get huge, uh, not just in height, but also uh, in the size of the leaf, which is just fascinating. And we see that with uh, our cherries. So on the mainland, we have uh, Prunus alyssifolia, uh, subspecies alyssifolia, which are holly leaf cherry, which is typically a uh, mid-sized shrub, uh, mid-sized to a tall, tall shrub. Um, but here on Catalina, it, it actually has evolved to become a pretty large tree. And uh, this one on, on the right here is actually a tree of life nursery, which is almost 35 to 40 feet. Um, and, you, and you can see uh, in the leaf here on the left, you can see the mainland uh, species, that much smaller leaf. And you can see it's also really rigid. So a little harder for, um, it's got, you know, spiky kind of, uh, ridges around the the kind of that holly leaf on the uh, on the leaf for, that would be harder and less you know makes it a little tough for the uh, an, an herbivore to eat and you've lost a lot of that in the and uh, to the island species uh, here on the left and uh, you can see it's got a much larger leaf it can put way more energy and resources into into these um, producing a lot more seed and, and being much bigger. Same with our buckwheat. So here is a uh, Catalina Island endemic. So it occurs only here on Catalina. This is the uh, Ariogonum giganteum or um, uh, St. Catherine, no, oh, it's escaping me right now. That's embarrassing. Um, um, but you can see much, much larger leaf, huge I think leaf. You're right. and, Saint, I think you're right, St. Catherine's lace. Oh, okay, okay. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, you can see it has really, really attractive big leaf uh, and, and huge displays of, of, of these abundant seeds and flowers. Um, and you can see even from here on the very far left, you see our mainland uh, area of Siculatum or California buckwheat or coastal California buckwheat. And then even just uh, to another island, which does get big, uh, the um, Ariogonum arborescence on Santa Cruz Island. And then on Catalina, it's just massive. It's, it's, it's a really big leaf. And so this one on the right uh, was in my garden. You can see just, there's about, there's only two here and just huge floral displays um, that just, if in your garden, it's, if you want butterflies, birds, everything, it's just a real great plant. Um, if you have the space, this is a fantastic one for habitat. Uh, and they do really well in different environments. So this is the Catalina um, silver lace. Just, I'm not thinking that maybe that's paper. I don't know why it's escaping me. Okay. St. Catherine's lace. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so we have a lot of different habitats here on the island. Uh, this is a recent study uh, using GIS and we're able to predict and under, uh, see a lot of different uh, habitat types and and this is very useful uh, when it comes to restoration, when it comes to where do we place and do focus restoration, where's some refuge for other places, or also where do we think we can go find some plants? And so this is a really, really good tool that, that has been developed. Um, but there are, you can see many different uh, habitat types on Catalina. So let's go through a couple of these. So immediately as you land, you can get to the coastal bluffs. And so this is kind of that little toral zone or right where the land meets the sea. And if you go and look, you can see like things like these Dudleya and everything like that. Um, it's dry, 
uh, but does get salt spray. Uh, there's not a lot of soil, so it's a really unique habitat that these species in this habitat have had to overcome. And we'll go through a couple of these uh, soon. There's Californica anchored. This is Goat Harbor, one of my favorite places. And then uh, coastal sage scrub. So we have coastal sage scrub on the mainland as well. And so we have species like uh, Encelia Californica or the um, uh, coastal sunflower. I love plants that have Californica, that boat name <laughs> in it. But uh, so this is also sometimes called island sage scrub uh, here on Catalina because we do have uh, a lot of different species as well that uh, occur just on the island. So it is a little bit more apropos to call it um, a, uh, an island sage scrub. Um, sometimes there's not as much sage in that area. So sometimes it's just called an island scrub. But for the most part, it's the same general type of habitat niche um, um, here on the island. And then coastal grasslands, man, these are, are really getting beat up uh, with some of the herbivores that we, non-native herbivores that we have here on the island. Uh, so here's a, a restoration effort down um, by uh, uh, Little Harbor and Shark Harbor um, to, to maintain and make sure that we have some of these species but in this habitat. But uh, you'll see some uh, familiar plants in here like yarrow, um, brodia, and uh, uh, also um, a calicordis, which I have a, uh, I'll go into more uh, later, uh, calicordis catalina, although it says that in the species name, does occur on the mainland as well, which is a gorgeous, gorgeous um, mariposa lily. And then chaparral, uh, so you know, dense habitat with a lot of the similar species like chemise, which we do have here as well, um, toyons and, and other species as well. So, um, but really, really thick areas, uh, but it, and, and similar type of uh, exposures that you'd see on the mainland. Uh, woodlands, so we have, this is where we have some of our really rare tree species uh, and areas that get maybe a little bit more fog and moisture uh, and also the exposure as well, but uh, in elevation, so. Some really cool species in here too. Uh, riparian areas, uh, so where we have stream beds and and uh, water runoff and and seeps. Uh, this is where you see a lot of these riparian wetland type plants. And then a rare kind of habitat that we that only kind of occur around the coast too in certain areas, uh, and we do have here on Catalina is the maritime desert scrub, or sometimes called a maritime succulent scrub. Uh, we have some of these on uh, the back side of the island that have really rare and unique species there too. Okay, so, so um, I hope you guys all don't get too seasick, uh, but we are going to then go aboard uh, my boat. This is the SV Californica. Uh, she's an 83 Cape Dory, if there's any sailors in, in there that care. Um, but yeah, it's a really good boat and um, it's taken us around and explored some really cool areas of the island, which I'll take you all with me. But, but first, uh, my chief safety officer, Jack, is, he will check all your life vests and make sure that everyone is safe and not taking any invasive species with you um, as we go ashore. So, okay, we'll leave here in Avalon where I am now. Um, and we'll all get ashore. I don't think we'd all fit normally, so this is a good way to do it. And we'll go to just not too far from here. We're going to go to a really unique spot, really like this spot called White's Landing. Uh, Moonstone Cove is also down in here, uh, but this is a big kind of valley and a lot of really interesting plants are right in this area. So as soon as you come in, especially in the springtime, you'll see a lot of peppered through uh, the hillsides here. Uh, these yellow flowers uh, is uh, along the coastal bluffs. Um, a really awesome plant, a succulent uh, called giant Coryopsis or Leptocene gigantea, uh, also known as, used to be Coryopsis gigantea. Uh, we do have these in the Palos Verdes area too. So it is not endemic to Catalina. Uh, in fact, it occurs along many of the Channel Islands and also Palos Verdes as well. So, um, but this is a gorgeous plant, huge uh, flowers uh, that are they're great cut flowers too. If any gardeners there would like something like this, uh, they do go dormant and uh, drop all their leaves uh, and are kind of 
dead Dr. Seuss-like sticks at some point of the year. But after the winter rains or odd summer rains we're having now, uh, then those will then store all that energy, use that energy and flush out these big displays uh, in, the, in the appropriate time in, in late winter, spring. So really, really kind of a, a, a staple of a Channel Island plant I mean, that occur quite a bit around here on Catalina. And then as we start to hike up a little bit, you'll see uh, just a great display of these um, uh, uh, mariposa lilies or the Catalina mariposa lilies is Calicordis Catalina. And man, it's just a gorgeous flower. Um, these do, like I said, these do occur on the mainland as well, but it, it's the, the one you'll see here on Catalina. As you go up a little higher, you see a lot of the poppies, right? Um, but this was interesting. The guy are in a uh, grassland here, native grassland. Uh, and but this is actually a different species of poppy. So we, uh, we know a Schultzia californica, a real orange, but you can see these is kind of a yellowish. Um, they do have a little orange to them too, but they can have a little variation. This is an island poppy or a Schultzia ramosa. And you can see kind of a little difference in the, in the leaf shape here too, uh, but real attractive uh, type of poppy that occur on the island that we have here in Catalina. This is a great plant um, and, and really exhibiting some of that island gigantism. Uh, this is the Channel Islands Silver Lotus, uh, this uh, or the Aquaspawn um, Asurgentiflora variety Argentius. And this, you can see, much larger bird foot type leaf, uh, bigger uh, lotus like puff uh, inflorescence all there, like this yellow and kind of mature to the orange and red as they grow stays like a ground cover. So in the wild, it likes to hug and around rocks. And so it's great and sunnier kind of rock gardens or along paths. So really great plant. Um, it does occur on a few other islands, um, even down into Baja as well. Uh, but this is one I love. We, we started growing a lot more at Tree of Life that became real, real popular. And so I hope to see this uh, more in the trade. Okay, as we get up a little higher up towards some of the woodlands here, uh, you'll see this, these really big uh, Prunus alyssifolia, although this is the Prunus alyssifolia lionia, or the, oh, taking a break real quick, but <laughs> uh, so that the, or the channel, uh, Catalina Island cherry. And so this is Prunus alyssifolia subspecies lionia. Um, it is a cherry, so it does have a great um, edible type of, of cherries. Uh, but the flowers are really cool. These inflorescence, they have these spikes of them that uh, swallowtail butterflies really, really like. A lot of butterflies like this plant. Uh, native bees as well. So great bird habitat plant if you want something much taller, uh, but also gives you a lot of uh, uh, resources for native pollinators as well, butterflies and, and other uh, insects as well. But you can see they can just land here and go crazy. I can hear when I was walking up to take this photo, just buzzing like, like crazy all around it. And it's attractive. And so yeah, once those, those are pollinated, then they go to an edible fruit, um, which I have seen in um, fox scat here. So it is a, a food and resource for, for, um, for the native animals here. And it kind of in those transitional zones too with, with the chaparral, uh, but also in around the woodlands, you see uh, a, a manzanita. And this manzanita occurs here on Catalina. This is uh, Arctostaphylus Catalina. And it's a really attractive manzanita. And it's, it's one that uh, doesn't get too tall, uh, but you can see it has great shape leaves, good structure to it, nice, interesting color. Um, and uh, I just need to get a photo to share with you all uh, once it's in, in flower. So uh, manzanita is also known as a little apple. Um, you, can, you can really see in these bell-shaped like flowers uh, in the winter. So you have winter interest there uh, that then go to this real like apple-like seed. So that's great for a food source as well for, for, um, for herbivores or um, yeah, foxes, other animals, birds as well. So uh, really, really great plant. And then the iconic, everybody wants this plant in their garden. This is the island bush poppy or Dendromecon harfordii. So we have uh, 
Dendromicon uh, rigida on the mainland. And then here in the Channel Islands and here on Catalina, we have this one, which gets much bigger, bigger leaf, bigger flower. So again, those that island gigantism. Uh, and this plant really, it's really difficult in the garden just because it needs to be the right place and really to be left alone. So uh, plant it the right time of year. And, 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 and like really at my place in Dana Point, so coastal, I really wanna be coastal too, um, uh, where I was previously living, uh, I established them planting only in the fall. I luckily had a good uh, rainier uh, winter that year. Um, and then I never touched it again. And just on a nice slope, kind of as I saw it uh, on the islands, try to mimic that type of habitat. So it got a lot of drainage, everything like that. And this plant just thrived, bloomed almost year round. Um, so there's some tips there for people that have probably lost uh, a, a Dendromicon, because yeah, it's not really a beginner plant uh, and it, horticulturally, but uh, if you can get it, it's, it's an excellent, excellent addition to this type of garden. And uh, this is up in White's Landing as well, uh, where we still are. Uh, this is within this little secluded area. Uh, and just the biodiversity here is just incredible. And so this is actually a contained area uh, to keep out some of the herbivores. So uh, we have non-native deer here that are just damaging the island like crazy because they did not, the plants did not evolve with those deer. And so, uh, there's a lot of effort to conserve these plants and save these plants that um, it's just a really big challenge unless um, some management happens with with the deer themselves so but here you can is an example of what you see when that deer has been excluded from an area so this is an, an enclosure and you see just some really rare plants just thriving through here you know, um, you see some uh, the dendromecon back here some toyon mainland species uh, some island ironwoods and some cherries, and then some really cool uh, plants we're going to talk about right here, like the fragrant pitcher sage. And so this is a, a sage in the sage family. Uh, this is Lepicinia fragrance. So as that species name uh, and common name, it's a really fragrant sage, uh, big leaf. So again, that gigantism and these beautiful bell-shaped flowers. So fantastic one in the garden, kind of a mid-sized shrub. Uh, it likes to a uh, bit of shade, uh, can handle some um, partial sun as well, but uh, mainly just around the coast. Uh, but the this fuzziness too, is just a way that it seems to also really like some fog. So again, a coastal plant, um, but a really good one, uh, pollinated by, you can see uh, bumblebees and smaller native bees where that will be able to get in there. Hummingbirds as well really like them. And uh, this rare one, uh, Catalina nightshade, uh, the Selenum wallacei, really rare plant. Uh, there's a lot of effort that we're going to go through uh, to be able to conserve this plant, but luckily it's actually pretty easy to grow. Uh, it's just it's having some issues uh, in habitat that we need to conserve. So, but you can see really big flowers, big leaves. Uh, so again, some of that gigantism, and like you'd see with like the chaparral nightshade on on the mainland. Okay, so we're going to leave White's Landing. And we're now going to go to oh my cut a little head to Goat Harbor. And so this is one of my favorite anchorages uh, in here. So again, as soon as you come ashore, this is where we're really going to see a really cool plant. Um, uh, this real silvery leaf here, uh, and and some of this uh, snapdragons here. This this is a great place to see these two uh, plants that that occur that are endemics of Catalina Island. Oh, actually the. See the snapdragon in somewhere else. Uh, but this is the Catalina silver lace. This is uh, Constancia nivinii. It used to be um, Eriophyllum nivinii. But you see, it has really kind of Dusty Miller like look to it. Uh, and a lot of people confuse it with Dusty Miller. But um, this one has that real fuzzy type leaf, which is an adaptation to drought, also to repel a lot of. Uh, uh, direct sunlight, but also maintain moisture within the leaf. So real attractive. I've had it in my garden, put on huge displays, this, um, of these yellow flowers above the, of that, that silver like leaf. I even took a photo here a few years ago of, of, of it like acting as an epiphyte. So seeds found it uh, here in Avalon and this Canary Island palm and just actually was really attractive. So 
Um, I, I tried to mimic this at my house by throwing seed up in, into some palms that existed there, but it just didn't take, but it's fine. Maybe, maybe some insects and birds ate them, uh, the seeds, but still really cool plant and shows how like they cling and find small bits of soil uh, on a coastal bluff. We did the same thing here in this Canary Island palm. And then the island snapdragon, I love this plant. This is Gambelia, used to be Galvesia speciosa, uh, great hummingbird plant. Uh, they, they can um, come in and, and, and get, to, get to the nectar within here. You can see it almost has like these dragon eggs uh, as the fruits start to, to form. Uh, these also really like to, to hang out along the coastal bluffs. Uh, and you'll see different variations of them. Uh, so a lot of times you'll see them with a waxy green leaf uh, although they do have fuzzy green leaves. So there's some phenotypic differences that you'll see around uh, on the island. Um, sometimes you'll see them occurring in the exact same spot, uh, but it's just some genetics there um, and some expression of it. And um, we've actually at Tree of Life introduced uh, Galvesia firecracker, uh, which has a more fuzzier type leaf to it. Great plant, a little, little bit more compact too, uh, and not so much of a, a vining type shrub. Uh, and recently, uh, there was some of the Conservancy members shared a white flowering one, although it's a little more than white. It seems like more of like a moon color. So Tree of Life just introduced this uh, as a moonstone as a cultivar. Uh, it stays actually not as tall too, a little bit smaller leaf, uh, but has this real attractive uh, moon color to it. Uh, so we um, uh, gave homage to not only Moonstone Cove, and Moonstone Beach, but also uh, to those glass bottom boats of, uh, named Moonstone. So seemed apropos to have that as a cultivar name. Uh, you see a lot of the Catalina Island Lift River uh, or the Dudley of Iron subspecies Hassii uh, on this side of the island, which is more the one facing the mainland, uh, where you'll see the Insularis more on the backside. Um, but you can see it has a lot of variation to it. And so not only is it kind of stubby in some ways, especially in more drought, um, but also can have much larger type uh, leaves um, and, and structure to them. But um, these are all Hassii uh, and they occur within the coastal bluff region. Okay, uh, we're gonna hike up just a little bit higher up into the Chaparral. And we see a lot of this, this is another uh, Catalina endemic. This is uh, Catalina perfume. It's also known as Evergreen current, although I really like the common name Catalina perfume, so I will use that and hopefully change more people to say it uh, because it has a really, really sweet, fragrant leaf that if you crush up and smell, it's just phenomenal. So I, I really like that name, Catalina perfume. Um, but it is called evergreen current, so most of the ribes uh, go dormant, and so they will lose all their leaves uh, and just real quick, uh, the ribes that have thorns are called gooseberries, and those that do not are called currants. So you have chaparral currants, uh, like ribes indicorum or malvasium um, or a, um, sanguinium. Uh, those all will lose their leaves and have seasonality to them. But here in Catalina, uh, we have this species of evergreen currant, and it's a fantastic shrub, a low shrub that kind of arches. Uh, underneath, it's great under oaks and other plants, uh, likes shade, um, and it also gets this really attractive maroon flowers to them. Uh, and those flowers, when pollinated, will have a berry uh, that's really great for birds and other animals as well to eat. And this is an awesome plant, another one of concern uh, uh, for the conservancy that we want to manage. Uh, but this is the California rock flower or Crossosoma californica, Crossosoma, however you want to say it. Uh, but this is a, a really, really great plant, uh, really rare uh, and occurs here on Catalina. And um, uh, I believe there is a small population on Palos Verdes as well, but gorgeous flower. Uh, it's just real attractive and interesting uh, seed shape as well. As we get a little bit higher, uh, you see this awesome grove of you know, as we get more into the woodlands uh, of the ironwoods. So they like to get right where that, that fog layer can kind of accumulate and get a little bit more moisture um, as a relic of the past. And um, yeah, as it's a member of the rose family. So it's a lot. And as that species name, Floribundus, uh, has these real abundant flower and fluorescence. 
of little rose-like flowers. And uh, you can see all that, that straight leaf here. It's just a really, really great plant, real upright uh, and attractive plant. So really, really cool. I haven't seen this out in the wild yet, although I'm sure I'm gonna see it soon. Uh, but this is the island oak, which I know does occur in this, this um, up in that area as well. Uh, this is Quercus tomentella, and again, just those real large, large, large leaves and uh, shape. Okay, I'm gonna leave Goat Harbor. And go to Bird Rock. So an island off of an island. And I bring up this uh, bird rock. So we're over at the Isthmus now. You can see uh, just the short walk towards both sides of the island, which is what the geographic feature of an Isthmus is. Uh, and you see Cat Harbor back here and Isthmus uh, Cove, or typically called in the city of Two Harbor right here, or um, yeah, uh, area of that. And then right off, you'll see this was called Bird Rock. And Bird Rock is actually a refuge for a, a plant. So you can see here it is, um, just a small, small little island with a little patch of, of green there and a lot of birds that like to, um, and so a lot, they use it as a nesting habitat. So it's really important place for that. Um, but this is refuge for the Malvi, uh, Malva Rosa. And so this is a, a subspecies that we have here on Catalina that's in trouble. This is the Lavatera astringenta flora, subspecies Glabra. And it's a real attractive member of the hibiscus family. Uh, but when I say that it's kind of trapped on this island or has found refuge here is because of those non-native uh, ungulates. So those hooved animals like deer, goats, and sheep, and then we've gotten rid of um, uh, the, the um, everything but the deer uh, and the bison. But the deer are really a problem that are, have caused that this, this plant can now only exist where those deer can't get to. So um, I'm glad it's there. There's a lot of effort to conserve the plant here on, within the conservancy uh, and we'll continue to do so. But you can just see it's a real attractive plant, real fast growing too, if you wanted it in your garden, huge leaf uh, type like um, uh, hibiscus, native hibiscus. Okay, we'll leave here go around to, oop, let me do that, Just, well, never mind, to the back side of the island at uh, Little Harbor. So this is one of my favorite places if you can get there. There's a, a swell and a reef and uh, all through here. So it's really hard, it's a really small area. So it's, and so only a couple boats can fit in there, but if you can, uh, and the swell's not too big, it's really worth it. So this is one of the best campsites on the island too. Backside, I love it because you get sunsets over the ocean, which is just not to be taken for granted. And so Jack came ashore. He has to be tied up because uh, we, it's really important that uh, people tie it and keep their dogs on leash because this is where you see um, nesting habitat for these snowy plovers. And so uh, they do occur around here. So be careful. Uh, and in this area, they're kind of cryptic, um, but but they enjoy this, the areas where, and they nest and, and, and uh, lay their eggs where we wanna be too, which is right in sunny beaches of California. So these, these birds are kind of in trouble. So uh, just be mindful and then yeah, keep your dogs on leash. Um, but it's also uh, a great place here in Little Harbor to see this little patch of a really rare plant that, uh, it, it does occur on the mainland as well, and it's rare here on Catalina, uh, where there's only a couple of spots, and, and Little Harbor is one of them. This is a, a really interesting cactus, so part of that um, that rare maritime succulent scrub or maritime uh, desert scrub you have, the golden cirrus. And this is just really cool plant uh, I've had in my garden, where it, it's just like it's right, especially in the winter time, if you get a little bit of dew and that longer uh, type of light that comes in in the, in the morning and afternoon just just make these plants just glow. It's a real golden light glow. And so this is Pajero cactus emery, uh, named after a botanist. Uh, but you can see it has a lot of really small spines and interesting arching habitat uh, shape. 
and um, that nice gold color. Uh, along the beach there, you also had the San Verbena. Uh, we do have these uh, on the mainland as well, but this is real important habitat that are they grow within the sand uh, for those snowy plovers and help maintain a lot of that sand dune habitat. Um, um, so really, but also a great pollinator plant uh, for, for that beach environment. Okay. All right, we're gonna leave Little Harbor and Shark Harbor. And we're gonna go to a real hard place to get to, oh, nope, not this that, to then Ben Weston. This is an awesome place, another great campsite. Uh, just down the way, oh, come on. And this is a great spot to see uh, the, the, the Delia Byron's in Sularis. In fact, there's like a whole wall of them. Uh, but some of the greatest photos I've seen of, and examples of this plant are on this back side of the island. So again, all the Dudleya virin subspecies Hassii all occur on the side, generally, all occur on the side facing towards the mainland. And on the back side, we have Dudleya virin insularis. And so it's called bright green, live forever. I've seen bright green versions of it. I wish it had a better name. I think island live forever is a great name for it. Um, but uh, yeah, this also occurs on the, on the Palos Verdes area but they really see them a lot on, on the backside. And you just see them in mass here. And so uh, now with the CNPS ruling, I, I previously I wouldn't really tell you exactly where to find where these are, but with, with these heavy fines and, and, and uh, penalties for poaching and, and a lot of the effort that we're doing for trying to get more deadly out of the trade, um, I think it's important that people actually go and appreciate them for those that are not poaching them. Um, and so Ben Weston is a great place to see, see this plant. Uh, it's also a great place. I saw um, Quercus pacifica, which occurs. It's kind of the more common oak, scrub oak you would see along the island. Uh, but I saw one of the biggest ones I've ever seen there. That so those can get into big, large uh, shrubs as well. Um, this is another island oak, um, or island scrub oak, really. Uh, Quercus pacifica that occurs here in Catalina. Okay, we're gonna leave Ben Weston and go over to a real remote spot that's not accessible uh, by people and for good reason because we um, are to the public because this is a really rough terrain and it's refuge to a really rare plant. In fact, the, the rarest plant in all of North America, uh, this plant, the Canalina Island Mountain Mahogany. So this is our number one focus plant, uh, priority plant, because it's there's only about six remaining individuals in existence. And so uh, we're still doing some of the genetic work to, to see exactly how many there are, but that's seeming to be the number. Uh, but there's the, this plant, so we have Circocarpus all on the mainland. Uh, people may know Circocarpus betuloides uh, or mountain mahogany, uh, but this one is a real Species, uh, unique species, which you can see real fuzzy like leaves, just cup shaped. It also has that island gigantism of larger leaf to them. Uh, but it's, it's a species that's being challenged by a unique phenomenon called uh, hybrid swamping or uh, genetic swamping, where you have another Circocarpus, which we have here, Circocarpus betuloides, uh, variety Blanchii, that is swamping. The, the pollen and everything that's way more common is circled around these six remaining individuals and all the seeds come up hybrid and, or generally will. And so most likely, and, and so it basically lost its ability to be able to produce pure seed. And these are really getting to be bigger, older um, specimens. And it's a gamble having them all in one really rough terrain where erosion, and fire are all really high possibilities, we could lose this plant overnight. So without being able to grow them from seed, and then also the ad added challenge as I've tried it at the nursery and many other people have tried cuttings, they're very unsuccessful. Um, even if you can get some to root, transplanting them to a larger size or even maintaining those, they die off. And so it's a real challenge to grow this plant. So what do you do? And so that's uh, some of the things that with, with my background in plant tissue culture, 
that we're gonna bring in as well as another tool in the tool belt to try and grow more of these plants to have more uh, um, uh, chances for them not to go extinct. And so you can see this is just a, a really cool, attractive plant. It could be a great plant in the garden, um, but just a unique plant we don't wanna lose because extinction is forever. And you can see a lot of those fruits coming off of them, but every one of those is most likely hybrids. And so what is plant tissue culture? It's a method of propagation where we're taking cuttings and trying to grow those plants, basically growing plants in test tubes. So we've removed all the environmental stressors, giving the plant everything it needs, all the sugars, all the nutrients, all the hormones, all the, the vitamins and, and, and the perfect growing conditions to then have a real gentle environment a uh, safe refuge for those plants, those little cuttings, micro cuttings to then grow root and, and produce new cuttings. And then um, we can take cuttings off of those cuttings and have exponential numbers of individual cuttings and individual plants, which every one of those would be another chance that that plant does not go extinct. And so that's a, a method we're trying to bring here to, to, the, uh, to the island. Um, and we'll do here as part of the work that I'll do here in Catalina. All right, we circled, we circled, navigated the entire island. We made it back to Avalon and I uh, hope you all come to the new trailhead. You'll follow me up there after our sail. You guys all have your sea legs now. Uh, the trailhead is a great place with the nice uh, new place here uh, in Avalon uh, where you can get your permits to go hiking, uh, gift shop, and also a uh, toy on grill, a nice restaurant and bar. And uh, we'll cheers to our stories with a nice prickly pear margarita. And uh, yes, they're actually really good. I just had one and I had to take a photo and have it as kind of our lasting uh, spot with a great overlook over to uh, Avalon. And um, yeah. So if you guys wanna follow me, I do have a YouTube channel where I do go ashore with my boat, Californica. Uh, if you'd like to follow along there, uh, you can follow us on Instagram and also on YouTube. Uh, where I'll go to different anchorages, uh, not just the islands, I'll also go to the coast and different areas around and describe the plants and animals that I see on those areas. Uh, also quick plug this Friday, uh, the Catalina Island Conservancy is having a symposium where there'll be uh, a lot of the conservancy members uh, and, and researchers and, and managers that will then be uh, displaying and, and rolling out all the type of conservation that occurs here on the island. Uh, it is available over Zoom as well, or uh, I'm not sure if it's Zoom, but it's, it is available towards uh, uh, remotely. So if you want to just chime in, uh, you can do that as well, or you can meet us in, per in person at the uh, Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach. That is this Friday. Uh, I'll put a link in the uh, chat in just a moment. But without further ado, yes, uh, I thank you all for joining me on this circumnavigation and exploration of the plants at Catalina Island. Thanks, Kevin. That was a great, great talk. Um, and I love the way you uh, broke the boat in there and everything. Um, I'm just going to look through the chat here and see if there's any questions. Uh, while I'm doing that, if anybody has any questions. So wait, let's see. Here's one. Um, is there a, a concern about too much common genetics among the plants? propagated by micro cuttings? Um, so, okay. So for that ex exact uh, question, the, the real answer is, well, we have six individuals left. So the, the genetic bottleneck has already occurred. So what we're doing is we're increasing the amount of chances that those six individuals have to one, not go extinct, but also to then use for seed bulking uh, so we can then increase uh, the amount of genetics that we can, um, uh, possibilities, uh, diversity that way, but then also having more individuals that we can then have these kind of refuge uh, uh, or other chances in different habitat types that might be suitable uh, for this plant uh, to grow. So uh, it, it's already a concern. And so we're just, um, there's nothing we can really do about that per se. Uh, we wouldn't really want to, you know, have just one clone 
out in, in the area. Um, but really, we would just be wanting to make sure that we uh, have every all the entire population, which is very doable, having only six represented. Um, and we can do that actually by keeping these plants uh, in test tubes. It's actually a method of germplasm storage. So much like seed banking, although the seeds are all typically hybrids, we have the, every one of those plants represented in multiple numbers. You can, main, you can keep that on a shelf basically indefinitely. Uh, it's actually also the intermediate step to cryopreservation. So uh, by getting these plants in vitro and growing in that way, we then can also cryopreserve all of them and make sure that they don't go extinct indefinitely. And so, yeah, the, it's, but to the question as far as genetic diversity, that bottleneck's already there with six left in existence. Uh, here's just a method to make sure that all those don't go extinct with many, many replications to make sure that those are chances. Now we're not gonna be crossing gen identical clones. Um, so that type of genetics wouldn't be a concern, um, but just making sure that we have the entire representation of the population conserved. Okay. So the subtext of his question, and you sort of answered it, but um, was, can they be inbred in a bad way like show dogs or a cat? Yes, so that's, that's part of what's wrong with the, the species itself. Uh, as far as it's kind of having only a, such, a, such a small population size, yes. So um, inbreeding depression, um, in addition to the hybrid swamping are all the challenges of the Stercocarpus trastidae. Okay, very fascinating. Um, all right, um, let's see, I'm trying to scroll through here. Um, the, it, while I'm doing this. Um, I just put the uh, symposium link in the chat anybody wants to uh, see more uh, of not just what we're doing with conservation of plants, but also wildlife um, and, and, and much, much more uh, with the conservancy that's there in that link. And it's remote too, if you can't make it to the actual uh, aquarium, which is always really fun. So uh, you've got a lot of compliments. Um... There was a question about whether uh, Betuloides is native to, to Catalina or is an invasive. Uh, so it is indigenous. So uh, it does occur um, on other islands. It does occur on the mainland, uh, Cercocarpus Betuloides. Although what we have here is an island form a variety of it called, that is much more common throughout the island. Uh, call, and, and other islands, I believe, uh, called Cercocarpus betuloides variety blanchi. And so that being so widespread, especially on the island, uh, right uh, is swamping out just in uh, where the last remaining Cercocarpus trasti are in Wild Boar Gully. And um, yeah, so it's not invasive. It, it is indigenous, it is, it is native. Um, but uh, I don't want to. I don't want to demonize that plant at all. It is not. Um, we don't know what's really going on with the, this interaction and the hybridization. All we know is that with six individuals left, extinction is forever. So we are going to make sure that we does not go extinct um, and be able to conserve it. But the hybridization is it, it is a problem for straight species trasky um, to no long to it not be trasky anymore. But we don't know what's going on there. There might be some hybridization. We might see some some drift. Maybe a new species evolving. I don't know. Um, that's that's all things that we as scientists have to look into and um, discuss and and study. Somebody asked what the difference was between uh, island sage scrub and coastal sage scrub. Uh, the composition of the species. So uh, the coastal sage scrub that we typically would think of on the mainland is kind of that general uh, coastal sage scrub, although you do have similar species. And so you have like in Celia californica, 
salvia mellifera, some black sage, you know, depending on where you are on the coast. Uh, so it's just because it occurs here on the island and some of the species you would typically see uh, didn't make it to the island and they, their niche has been filled in by an, a species that occurs maybe only on the island. So uh, it is a little bit different, uh, small differences in, in some of the habitat, um, you know, microclimates, but it's, it is a very similar composition of plants, uh, but there is differences being here on the island. So really it's just about the, the composition. Okay, that's a good answer. Uh, if anybody in the audience has questions, uh, feel free to unmute yourself at this point and ask your question. Oh, this is Linda Gonzalez. I just wanted to thank you for acknowledging the Tongva and Pimu Island. Oh, good. Well, thank you. Um, Uh, this is this is Gerald Melling. Sorry, I, I did miss the first minute or so, but um, I did the Trans Catalina Trail with my son a few years ago, which was fantastic, and saw a lot of the great plants. Um, I, I I just missed Kevin what your connection was with Tree of Life, and if we wanted to get any of these plants, is that one of the best places to go and look for them? Uh, absolutely. So uh, yeah. so I was the production manager at Tree of Life for the last seven years. Um, and I just made the transition to Catalina this weekend. Uh, and my first day with the Conservancy is Thursday. Uh, but yeah, no, Tree of Life is, is the best place, especially to get Channel Island plants. Um, that's kind of been partly as a grower. Uh, what The question as a, as a grower is always, what do you grow and how many? Uh, but for me, my love for for the Channel Islands and for Catalina and a lot of Dudleya too. That's those are the best places. Uh, uh, what a lot I grew there and um, and and so yeah, it's a great place to get those plants. Some really unique ones and ones we're trying to get into more into the horticultural trade as well. So um, uh, actually, also here at uh, at Catalina Island Conservancy in Middle Ranch, we have the uh, Ackerman Nursery. It is a native plant nursery, and that you're we are always looking for volunteers if you are out here on the island, uh, but you can also purchase plants as well. So plants that have been grown, uh, a lot of it's grown for restoration and conservation, but it's also open to the public. And so you can get some of those nice Catalina Island plants as well. This is a good time for me to uh, remind everybody that starting tomorrow, we're having our plant sale and some of these plants uh, will be available because they are also found on the peninsula. Um, and they're native to the peninsula, obviously not the endemics, but um, some of them, certainly the Dudleyas, uh, I believe will have some of those. Um, so um, I encourage everybody to uh, check out the link for that. And of course, again, we need volunteers for that. Also, um, your uh, Catalina Island Symposium, uh, I'm sure will be a great program. I also, uh, in the chat, I was reminded, uh, not to mention my announcements at the beginning, that um, next month will be the CNPS Conservation Conference in San Jose. Um, there was a song about that as well, although um, Catalina Island is closer, it's more beautiful, and it's certainly more romantic than San Jose. But <laughs> nevertheless, <laughs> the CNPS... If anybody does go to that, um, I'll see you there because I, I will be giving a, a talk on Dudlia and the representation of the work that I was done at Tree of Life and, and we'll continue. If, so. if you didn't have enough reason before, <laughs> uh, the opportunity to actually meet Kevin Allison in person uh, will be worth your trip to San Jose. <laughs> so, um, all right, any other questions from the floor? I appreciate we have really had a really great turnout uh, tonight. We had at one point I saw 42 people, so uh, that was great. And uh, I um, think I in the newsletter I mentioned um, uh, that uh, we're hoping that we'll be able to put together a, uh, a field trip to Catalina about three years ago, three, four years ago, five, something like that. Uh, we had a chapter field trip to Catalina. And uh, we got on a bus and uh, drove around with, I believe it was with Peter. Um, and it rained that day, it was in, in April, uh, I believe. 
but it, it actually rained that day a lot. Um, so we had to kind of change our itinerary around, but nevertheless, we had a uh, fabulous trip. So once you get your, um, once you learn the ropes over there, um, we'll get in touch, Kevin, and we'll, we'll work on a, a field trip in the spring. Uh, to I look forward to it. Yeah, we'll stay in touch. All right. Well, All right. Everybody, um, uh, I think um, Brett could stop the recording. And then um, if anybody has any questions, they don't want to be recorded, uh, they could hear that. Uh, Brent.